And in this uh, second uh, session, we welcome uh, Professor uh, Danilo Mandic from Imperial College London. Um, he is professor and uh, co-director of the Financial Signal Processing Laboratory at Imperial. He works in the areas of statistical signal processing and machine intelligence. He's a fellow of the IEEE and has been a member of the Board of Governors of the International Neural Network Society. He has more than 500 publications and has received the President's Award for Excellence in Postgraduate Supervision at Imperial. Um, his work related to this talk includes a book, Recurrent Neural Networks for Prediction, two recent monographs, and ongoing work on data analytics in graphs. He has the Dennis Garbor 2019 Award from the International Neural Network Society and a 2018 Best Paper Award from IEEE Signal Processing. Uh, so it gives me great pleasure now to ask Professor Danilo Mandic to speak on tensors, graphs, and deep networks, convergence of concepts and ideas. Professor Mandic. Thank you very much. It gives me great pleasure to talk to our audience today, and uh, this being an event by the Institute of Mathematics, so actually I'll try not to have any equation in my slides, although there will be a couple. So let me see if I can share my screen now. Uh, this one will do, correct? So that's Richard, I'm fine, hoping you. that you can see my screen now. Yes, that's fine, thank you. Fantastic. So, so my talk is really on, on, on sharing some, perhaps high level ideas on the commonalities between big data uh, represented through tensors, graphs for data analytics on irregular domains and deep networks. So these are three seemingly disparate concepts. However, through linear and multilinear algebra, you'll see hopefully how they can be considered under one umbrella and how we can benefit from domain knowledge in graphs, say, to to have a better neural network and how can we use tensors to dramatically decrease the, the, decrease the dimensionality of, of deep networks. Okay, without much further ado, so the crux of my talk will be on tensors for, for super compression of data and we'll see how that the so achieved super, super compression can be used to optimize neural networks. Okay, so when you talk about big data processing, then it's also, of course very interesting to, to talk about biological neurons versus artificial neurons and, and such like. And in this slide, we can see some simple, simple, simple comparisons. Computers do excel at algorithmic, uh, algorithmic tasks. So, so so big data processing. So of course we are talking about biologically inspired data processing and such like, which is the motivation for neural nets. But you see the, the computers are excellent at solving algorithmic tasks. So we program them and they can, they can perform search in an unprecedented way. However, they're not that well equipped for ill-posed problems while biolog biological systems are. For example, a simple, simple pigeon brain with 1 billion neurons and cycle time of 0.1 seconds is very similar in its operation in terms of number of operations per second to an old PC. However, clearly the pigeon can live perfectly well and make fantastically complex decisions while this type of computer can't. So, so what can we do? We can go one way, which is to increase increase computing powers in a brute force approach until we, we, we are hoping to reach the performance of simple brains. Or can we maybe try to make sense somehow from big data in order to use standard computers to do to the same. Now, intentionally I've taken this from, from the year of 2011. It's the uh, basically vision by the McKenzie Global Institute it says that in 2010, there'll be 4 billion mobile phone users in the world. Now we are in 2020, clearly we have more than 4 billion 
mobile phone users we, who soon will be uh, having a 5g network and constant video sharing and the data traffic will be will be very very uncomfortable for the network now with the 40 percent prediction in the growth in global data per year and five percent in the growth of global it spending we clearly have a problem because the it networks the the infrastructure cannot cope any longer with the amount of data or soon it won't be able to we've seen that during this covid uh, situation where most of the broadband providers were struggling to to cope including myself back at home now this gives us the opportunity to 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 look into how can we maybe uh, deal with data in a more interesting and intelligent way in order to to make sense from such data and help the help decrease the computational load which brings me to the well-known the four v's of big data the v's being the volume because when i started my career a kilobyte of data was plenty now i just bought a hard disk of two terabytes and a petabyte is not really unimaginable variety because we are now examining time series images 3d images probabilistic data uh, semantic data all under one umbrella uh, velocity whoever has trained the neural networks in the past they, they remember batch processing many many epochs of data now we are trying to move towards streaming data so indeed people like researchers at mclaren formula one team they, they at their headquarters in in walking they're analyzing data from any racing circuit in the world online the data about the car and uh, physiological parameters on the driver circuit and such are kind of being streamed to to the uk the decisions are being made immediately and the decisions are being sent back and veracity which is basically an interesting way to say some sort of noise or uncertainty in data okay so how do we deal with this one way is to look at how data are acquired and try to learn from the data acquisition process which brings us to graphs so graphs have very very long history and go back to euler who at that time lived in Königsberg, today's kaliningrad and there's seven uh, bridges in that city the question was whether somebody can cross all the seven bridges without without crossing the path basically so that's the beginning of graph graph theory now the most interesting modern applications of graphs are in internet topologies uh, power grids or finding anomalies maybe in internet traffic like in the recent enron insurance scandal okay so graphs by themselves uh, are not new obviously that two or three hundred years old however the uh, the analysis of data on graphs which is what we are concerned with is fairly new and we can talk about maybe the last 10 years of research um, i like history so i looked back at the prospectus at my home institutions and in the year 1970-79 i could find a course on communications actually which was talking about graphs for coding while back in 1984-85 we can see a course on graph theory so those were taught by my predecessor in this role professor anthony constantinidis and those graphs were basically static uh, still you can do plenty of interesting optimization of graphs but now if you have to optimize graphs themselves and find meaning in data on graphs that becomes much more interesting and underpins many new applications so i myself have tried to to get myself into data analytics on graphs and the way I thought about this was a simple temperature measurement. So this is a site on the Adriatic Sea, and you can see the sea, a bay, a medium height mountain, high mountain, this is a capital, this is a lake and the lowland. So these are the temperature sensors. So here's a snapshot of temperatures uh, recorded by these sensors indexed one to 64. You can see something very very interesting so a the sensing grid is irregular 
So that's very interesting. The second thing is that if you would like to make any very simple analysis or data conditioning, for example, to find the average temperature, here you have a sensor number 30, uh, 36, which is, which is next to the sea, and the sensor number 37 high up on the mountain. So you have very, very high, high difference in temperature so that anything that you do with standard data analytics, which assumes a regular sampling in time or special sampling is not going to work very, very well. So instead, we need to think how to accommodate those irregular data structures. Of course, that's more complicated, complicated but the advantage is that we can talk about neighborhoods, about processing local information. So this 64 sensor grid cannot be thought about as a set of neighborhoods. So indeed, this is a neighborhood next to the sea, a neighborhood at the low mountain, neighborhood at the high mountain, a neighborhood near a lake, also low land. So clearly, if you like to do, say, simple averaging, you should do it with respect to the neighborhoods rather than the global averaging. The second thing you can do is you can establish some connectivity between those sensors and neighborhoods. For example, it's clear that this neighborhood next to the sea is not going to have a direct link with the neighborhood high up in the mountains, but it can have an indirect connection through some of those other, other nodes. So the second thing is that you can think about the temperature difference in terms of the physical distance between two sensors and distance in the altitude. This also makes it possible to design a graph which uh, represent temperature sensing in this geographic area. Now, how about a signal on a graph then? So the black dots here are the sensors, the red lines are signals on the graph, and now some, something interesting happens. So now I can no longer use the standard equidistant sampling in time or spatial sampling, but I still have signals on graphs, which can be represented by these uh, bars or by those circles with the color uh, designating the value of a signal. Okay, becomes more and more interesting. Now, how do we describe a graph? So this is from our recent uh, three volume work, which we are hoping to publish in uh, one of the series of non publisher. So, the graph can be represented by a set of vertices, which are nodes here, one to one to seven. These are connected by edges in blue, and each edge can have a weighting telling us how our confident, how, how dependent the, the nodes are. So, which brings us to a weighting matrix. So, each node can have so-called degree, a sum of the weights at its node and some combination of the weights and degrees gives you the Laplacian matrix for a graph. Now, when we say that we know a graph, basically we mean that we know the Laplacian matrix which describes the graph. It's a big step because with matrices we can use linear algebra to do many, many operations, perform operations on a graph, and we know how to do this. Okay, the second thing is that if if uh, every matrix, of course, uh, in this case, it's a square matrix has eigenvectors and eigenvalues. We know that the eigenvectors U are orthogonal in eigenvalues lambda can be sorted in a decreasing order. Uh, what happens on a graph is that the first non-zero eigenvalue is the smoothest, and the next one is uh, less smooth and so on, so on, so on. And we know that, sorry, the eigenvectors, obviously. Uh, are the smoothest and then less smooth and so on, and that they're orthogonal, which brings us to the notion of a basis. So indeed, very much like the harmonic basis here in the Fourier domain, Euclidean domain, we can talk about a uh, basis or spectral analysis of, of, of graphs in the eigen domain. And indeed, these are the first several Laplacian uh, eigenvectors on a Minnesota road network graph and you can see that this one is the smoothest, the less smooth, less smooth, and so on. So we have a new representation space. Okay, so that's very, very good. And if you have a spectral representation, so very much like in the Fourier transform, a convolution in the time or vertex domain uh, 
is equivalent to the product in the spectral domain and that gives the basis for convolutional graph neural networks. Another thing that we need to think about is the graph shift. So in, in standard uh, data analytics, if you have a pulse here on a graph, a shift would mean that this pulse spreads on the neighborhood uh, nodes. But actually the information diffuses if you have more, more than one shift. And the second thing is the more you shift your data, the more you increase the energy in the data. So that's a big problem. So we can talk about graph neural networks, graph signal processing, but even a simple system on a graph, which includes a shift, is compromised by, by the inability of the graph shift operator to, to bound the signal energy. So our first basically uh, inroads into this area was to perhaps uh, um, suggest a new way to, to to establish a graph shift operator which is both preserving the energy and is unbiased. And with that we can then talk about filtering in the graph domain. So if these are the temperatures which are noisy and unfiltered, in the simple filtering in the vertex domain you can have really nice clustering basically of sensors or temperatures near the seaside in this example near the capital and on the mountain. Okay so just to summarize what graphs do to us, so you can talk about processing data on irregular domains. If data are encoded as a graph, you can have many interesting ways of visualizing such data, identify clusters in data. If you have clusters, you can maybe separate graphs through graph cuts into smaller entities and in such a way perform dimensionality reduction. Again, through some causality chains and such like, you can arrive at very simple ways to perform decisions. Like in this case, we're talking about a recommender system, seller or buyer. Okay, uh, graphs and neural nets. If you think about these nodes and neurons and those connections as weights, in graphs, it's very easy to make a so-called graph cut, whereby you can disconnect uh, parts of this bigger graph into two subgraphs and you disconnect again along a line of least sum of the weights, so the least disturbance. You can think about this as a way maybe to simplify huge neural networks. And clearly, the difference between the standard convolution neural networks with the layers like input, feature extraction, classification, such like, and the graph ones is a bit of graphs to accommodate for irregular irregular data domains. So uh, my own work in this area basically includes, this is a lecture note basically in IT Pixel and Processing Magazine, trying to, to illuminate how we can move from standard data analytics to graph data analytics in a, in a seamless way. And this is a three part, hopefully monograph on, on data analytics from graphs. The first part deals with basic definitions. Second is analysis of data on graphs. And third is machine learning on graphs. Now, going back to big data, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about tensors now and then try to converge uh, with tensor graph neural networks. So when you think about data types, you basically, as you shift the gears, you have scalar vector matrix and a tensor, so it's a collection of matrices. But of course, a tensor is a data entity by itself, so, so we can talk about the fourth order tensor, which is basically a vector whereby each element is a tensor and such like. So we can have these multi-way relationships between data, which happens to be very, very, very interesting. Uh, so we're dealing with tensors routinely without really realizing we are talking about tensors. So for people who have been analyzed uh, color images, we know that they are recorded in the R, G, and B domains. So if you'd like to compare this apple and this tomato, one way to do that would be to split the, uh, the color image on apple in, into its uh, red, green, and blue components. Do the same with the tomato, uh, build a tensor. So a collection of matrices from from the apple and from the tomato and perform some, some comparisons. And there's many interesting results in so-called ensemble learning for tensors and such like, which showed that in this way, 
using tensor algebra, multilinear algebra, you can perform this in a much more interesting and insightful way. So going back to tensors, I would just like to demystify them. So tensors is not only a 3D entity, it can be ND, 10, 10 dimensional, five dimensional, whatever. But in, every, every, in all cases, you can talk about its elements. So a 2D components are called, which are matrices are called slices. In this case, we have for a 3D sensor, horizontal slices, lateral and frontal. But of course, you can think about all the vectors that, that, that are contained in a tensor. So you can talk, they're called fibers. So column, row and tube fibers and, 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 and such like. So in many ways, this helps us to reshape tensors. So uh, recently in 2016 and 17, we, we published a two volume monograph with now publishers which is also standalone articles in foundations and trends in, in uh, machine learning. So one part is maybe 180 pages, the second is 250 pages, and particular attention has been paid to performing all these complicated multi-index tensor operations in a graphical mode. So for example, here we have a matrix. So that matrix is an entity with two three edges, so two-dimensional. This matrix we can vectorize, we can, uh, we can uh, sample it column by column and concatenate to build a vector, very long vector. So that vector is an entity with dimension one, one edge. Or you can combine these matrices separated by black lines into a cube so as to have a tensor of data. So it's an entity with three edges. That tensors can be further split into in many ways. And this is basically a 3D tensor where each element is a 3D smaller tensor. So we have an entity with six dimensions. So this is called reshaping, reshaping of a tensor. So again, I'm giving a very high flying overview because the concepts are seemingly very, very different. And I'll try to converge a little bit later. So now I'd like to show you why tensors are so interesting. So consider a simple video clip. It's a Lion King. And suppose that each frame here is each image is uh, of 1000 by 1000 pixel size. So if we have 20 seconds with 50 frames per second rate, which is high definition uh, video, we have 1000 frames from those 20 seconds in the horizontal arrangement. Now, of course, for a brain, or even for a pigeon brain, I think 20 seconds is quite kind of short memory. We can remember what's happened in a video over 20 seconds. But if you want to use a computer to analyze, to make an inference between slide number one and slide number 1000, the search space on this slide would be 1000 by 1000 pixel. The search space along the horizontal time evolution of uh, video of uh, frames would be 1 million. So 1,000 slides with 1,000 pixels. It's very, very clear that this short and wide matrix is not very amenable to, to, to analysis. And if you'd like to use brute force to express it, you have a matrix of 1,000 times 1 million pixels. So one gigapixel size of a matrix. Even performing simple correlations would be prohibitive on your computer. However, if you combine these slides now into a cube, slides frames into a cube, then you would have uh, for each frame 1000 by 1000 pixels, and you have 1000 frames along, along the time mode. So we're talking now about the mode, horizontal, vertical, and time. So clearly within tensors, you can combine different physical quantities into one unifying framework. And what's more interesting is that now the search space on one frame would be 1000 by 1000 pixels and the search space along the 20 seconds of data would be also 1000 frames. So we are talking about much, much more compact representation. In many, many other disciplines like the brain science, you talk about EEG recordings. So from all these channels who have time series, which you can matricize by time frequency representation. For example, horizontal axis is time, vertical axis is frequency, and these 
yellow vertical lines are basically eye blinks, which are very wide band. So we can combine all these into a cube, a tensor, 3D tensor. Now, for each of the uh, sessions, you can combine them again into, into one tensor. So the fourth dimension would be session. Then the fifth dimension would be subject. You can combine responses from all subjects into one tensor. And the seven dimensions will be stimuli and so on, so on, so on. So easily you end up with an eight, nine, ten dimensional tensor from many experiments on many subjects, perhaps on the same, on the same paradigm, which is much more amen amenable to the analysis. Another interesting thing is that in the tensor domain, we can talk again about, about convolution, like we can talk with vectors and matrices, and the properties are very, very similar. The convolution between the tensors A and B is a tensor C with enlarged dimension. I haven't mentioned the curse of dimensionality yet, but I will. So in many, many uh, aspects of scientific computing, we have to evaluate a multidimensional function on a grid. So assume that we have a 3D function, which is sampled at 1000 points in each dimension. So that gives us 1 billion samples. Now, if you, 1000 sampling points is not that high. So if you enlarge the number of dimensions to four, for example, and the number of sampling points by 10, then you have an exponential rise in the number of elements here is 10 to the power of 16. So even a simple four dimensional function finally sampled becomes impossible to compute on. But when, when you think about 10,000 sampling, think about the CD uh, quality audio is sampled about 40 kilohertz. So each second you have 40,000 samples. So it's not that high the resolution we have and still it's almost impossible to deal with it. Now we have to resort to some automatic uh, uh, analysis of data. And here we are talking about multilinear algebra. In very much the same way as in standard linear matrix algebra, we can decompose a matrix into a sum of its rank one components, which are outer products of vectors A, I, and B, I. And these are the eigenvalues. So we can do the same with tensors. Basically, this cube can be split into outer products of vectors A, I, B, I, and C, I, where R is the rank. So we have the same type of arrangements. Now, that gives us some interesting opportunities because uh, maybe uh, the rank can be very, very high and plenty of those terms can be related to noise. So we could perhaps perform dimensionality reduction by, by looking carefully into the tensor ranks. So this procedure here, which is similar to SVD, is called the canonical polyadic decomposition. It's the basis of a multilinear algebra. Back to the Lion King. So, Let's get back at, at, at the setting where you have 1000 by 1000 pixels for every frame and 1000 frames uh, over 20 seconds of data. So this tensor is of size 1000 by 1000 by 1000, which is one gigapixel of, of uh, data. If you decompose it using the canonical polyadic decomposition into the sum of those rank one terms, then here it's a cartoon obviously. So the rank is of course very, very low because the background along different frames is similar. It's either a blue sky or a grass or a desert and such like. And the frames are not very different from one to another because we are talking about 50 frames, frames per second. So typically for this type of problem, the rank would be 10. So we are talking about 1 billion of data which should be represented as 1000 pixels times one to three, so 3000 times 10, the rank. So we can convert the raw data of one billion pixels into a uh, canonical polyadic decomposition format, which has 30,000 pixels only. So you see that the tensor decompositions perform a super, super compression of data. You'll see later, and the idea is very clear, if we can use this type, this principle to deal with, say, uh, 
enormous dimensionality of weights in deep learning. So you have you can have millions of neurons with connectivity, which can be very very dense. So think about a graph. If 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 you can convert that using these principles into much more manageable information, then we are on to a winner. And that all comes without significant degradation in performance. The second thing is that with tensors, we can then use physical intuition and physical meaning. So if you're talking about the matrix rank as the number of those uh, uh, independent altered products uh, which built up the matrix, and for tensors, you add the, the, the other outer product with the vector C. So you can think about the matrices outer with vectors. It seems very, very simple, but all of us have been to a shop, maybe trying to, to, to choose colors for decoration of our houses. Think about a color ensemble here. And here we have one, two, three, four, five colors, but you can have 10,000 colors here. So clearly, and I intentionally started presentation with the RGB uh, pictures of tomato and, and apple. So clearly the base colors here, are red, green, and blue. So any of these colors can be obtained as mixtures of R, G, and B. So although you can have 10,000 different colors and 10,000 times the size of matrices, the structure in data is very, very high and boils down to a linear combination of three base colors. For example, for the gray here, the vector C would have equal amounts of red, green, and blue. While for the orange there, you could have plenty of red, uh, half of that of green, a little bit of blue. So clearly, to represent, uh, I can't cal cal calculate by uh, heart now, how many data, how much data would you have here? All you would need is some known base matrices and very, very simple mixing, mixing vectors. Okay, hoping that now you are convinced about the power of vectors, of tensors, we can talk about other types of decompositions and maybe splitting data into even smaller chunks. One of these decompositions is so-called Tucker decomposition, which decomposes data into a small core tensor and outer factor matrices. Uh, you can force the, the, uh, the elements, it is much like an uh, SVD, to be orthogonal, in which case we're talking about orthogonal Tucker, or you can think about splitting this tensor, the cube, into a concatenation, we we'll call it contraction of modes, of smaller core tensors. So, the outer, the outer factors are matrices and the inner factors are tensors. So this is called a tensor train. And this is a naive attempt very early on in this area. We tried to, to because the tensor train, to, to represent this as, as carriages on the train. You can see the buffers here. Okay, so what is it we can do? And, and talking about uh, low rank, uh, low rank uh, approximation for matrices, we can do the same for tensors. So this tensor in attacker decomposition can be decomposed into uh, uh, with dimensions I1, I2, and I3 into the outer matrices U1, U2, and U3, with the same dimensions I1, I2, I3. R is the rank and, uh, and a core tensor. Now, if you drop the, if, so if you do a low rank approximation, so you drop several of those outer products, reduce the dimensionality here by say two, there by two, there by two, and there by eight. That is the principle of higher order singular value decomposition. With tensors and multilinear algebra, of course they are richer than linear algebra. Linear, linear algebra gives you a flat view of events while tensors are much more natural. You can also do mixing of ranks. So, this will be decomposition of images in some person identification setting into rank one components in the tensor way. And you can see that, well, these basically matrices carry no physical meaning. However, if you decompose the same thing into rank one, rank three, full rank, and so on, with vector C mixing these, you can see, for example, this factor here would be responsible maybe for eyebrows. This factor will model maybe the hairline. 
and such like. So in these so-called block term decompositions, you can you can uh, enhance physical meaning of your of your data. I'll just finish with a few few examples. Uh, tensors thrive on redundancy in data. So wherever you have plenty of structure in data, you can use tensors to to exploit that structure and make things simpler or enhance processing. For example, uh, tensors and Kronecker uh, Kronecker products uh, go hand in hand, especially when we talk about Kronecker separability. So this is the original original picture of Lena, and those of you working in image processing have seen it many many times. Then, even with forty percent of data missing, the tensor reconstruction gives you pretty good image. If you have ninety percent of data missing, you can still have a pretty good recovery. And I'll not go into detail. I'll point you to the work where this was published. Uh, the second thing is uh, talking about latent components in data. So with tensors, you can connect in a generalized regression way two data sets, X and Y, and you can find which components in X are responsible for, for some behavior in Y by aligning, so again, you have the SVD-like type of uh, decomposition by aligning the, the the latent factors T and U like that. You can you can see which portion of X is, is responsible for the behavior of Y. Now that's a bit abstract, I know, but this is an experiment we did back in 2003. Uh, I've been a frontier researcher in RIC and Japan for many years, and uh, they had uh, laboratories and, and monkeys. So monkey was sat in a chair and the monkey had uh, markers uh, for motion capture system and also an e-code uh, system with 32 channels. So the idea was to predict arm movement from, from EEG. Now, we all know that EEG is responsible for, the, the brain commands are responsible for arm movements, but it's only a proportion of EEG brain electrical activity we can record that's it that's a responsible for arm movement because if i move my arm at the same time i'm i'm looking at the screen talking thinking what we're going to do next sensing how hot or cold my room is and such like so the goal is how to identify the precise i'll call it proportion but latent components in eeg which are responsible for arm movement and if you combine the 32 ECOG recordings uh, represented as time frequency into a cube, which is a tensor, and we, for those of you who are more into neuroscience, you would know that the mu rhythm in EEG about 10 Hertz is a signature of, of motor uh, command, you know, muscle movement. And you can almost see here 10 Hertz, 10 Hertz in the frequency. And these are the, this is the tensor, produced by the X, Y, and Z components for the four markers markers on a hand. So four by three, a tensor time, time, time series. So in the tensor setting, you can perform this regression, no problem. Although the X, Y, Z positions in space are very different from the microvolts in EEG. And anyhow, the EEG comes in a very, very convoluted way. Using standard transfer functions, standard signal processing, that would be impossible. You can do this using neural networks, obviously, but you have a black box, black box model which you couldn't control. And the problem with neural nets, obviously, especially deep nets, is not why they works, work, but when they, when, they, when they don't work, you don't really know why. While clearly in a tensor way, you, you maintain the physical meaning associated with data. You train this model, and then from the new VEG data, you can pretty well in, in, in red, predict the original tra trajectory in, in green. So it's time for me to start concluding. So tensors definitely can deal with the curse of dimensionality through tensor network representation. So even an enormously big tensor can be split into uh, smaller sub-tensors, which can be located even on different computer, and they, they can be processed sequentially like in the tensor train decomposition. At the extreme, so this very, very long vector can be represented as a six-dimensional tensor, 
with only two components in each, in each mode, so-called QTT, quantized tensor decomposition. If you look at this type of tensor networks, they, 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 they remind you of graphs, but, but connection is actually, the actual connection is not that obvious, but they also remind you of neural nets and clearly you can have some hierarchical structures and you can perform many, many operations on a graph rather than using multi indices in a tensor. For example, here we can split, uh, split the core into, in, in red, into much smaller cores and attach the outer dimensions to a tensor. So clearly we could perform many various operations, including the, the uh, what's called the pre-whitening and such like in a much, much easier way. Uh, I mentioned that, that uh, from the Lion King operation that the number of data in a row tensor is I times J times K. So exponential in the dimension N the number of elements in the uh, canonical polyadic decomposition representation is linear in the number of components here are which is which is huge huge help you can do many many things in the tensor domain which uh, may be not uh, achievable in the matrix domain like here you can think about hyperspectral imaging which is naturally a tensor so many wavelengths of this, uh, of this uh, images at various wavelengths of the same frequency. And just the last couple of minutes to connect, to demystify neural net and maybe associate some physical meaning with them. So I started doing neural nets back in late 1990s and have published a book on recurrent neural networks with while in 2001. And I always struggled with computational issues and also maybe with, with physical meaning interpretation. But now, if you have a huge neural network, uh, there's nothing much you can do in terms of it optimization, but you can definitely represent the huge uh, weight tensor as a tensor network, and you can optimize tensor network in any any way. So you can super compress it and transform it back to the neural network domain. In this way, you are arriving at the much smaller size optimized neural network at which you cannot arrive in a standard brute force way and this neural net is hopefully easier to train and run on simple, simple, simple computers. Uh, again, so uh, shallow neural nets here, deep networks uh, are uh, amenable to CPD decomposition while uh, deep neural networks are very well represented as high hierarchical Tucker decomposition or tensor, tensor train. Our own work in this area includes the Tucker tensor layer for optimizing deep networks, whereby we were able to perform tensor value backprop, which is interesting by itself. And uh, just showing here a synthetic example with images, which are either containing horizontal or vertical lines, you can see that the gradients along the modes are either favoring one dimension, one more or the other, reflecting basically the nature nature of data. And with several data sets, we're able to perform here, say, 66-fold compression in the number of parameters while maintaining 94.6 accuracy. Uh, the original accuracy was 98, maybe. So clearly, this is the way, this is the way to go. Uh, if you think about the graphs, data on graphs, if you think about a graph at consecutive time intervals, you're getting a tensor. So tensors and graphs are related. If you think about any notion which is Kronecker separable, so you can have dimensions which are represented as outer products of vectors, you can have both graph and a tensor. With that, I'm just trying to finish. I know I've opened more ideas than given answers. Uh, our, our own toolbox for, uh, for higher high tensor decomposition is called the hot box. It's hot of the press set at the, uh, the um, GitHub. You of course have very well established tensor lab by, by Levin and Lathauer from, from Levin, tensor lie, tensor train toolbox and, 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 and such like. Um, the upshot is that if you think about the big data paradigm, 
then it's very very natural to 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 first try to perform dimensionality reduction so the problem of finding the needle in a haystack is basically trim down the haystack and then maybe you'll find the needle the same applies to big data analytics with tensors or deep networks or graphs and uh, again some of our own work in this area includes the this paper in signal processing magazine which got the best paper award it's basically a very simple introduction to signal processing on the tensor domain again uh, trying to avoid many many multi-index equations and replace them with graphical operations this is more recent is tensor networks the two volume monograph uh, in in the uh, new publishers with new publishers then again in foundations and trends in machine learning and uh, the bulldog spirit of the brits is represented here <laughs> if you go from a scalar to a tensor you're going to beef up and be much more strong and resilient and with that i'd like to thank you for your attention it's really weird to talk to yourself although you know you have audience but you can't see them uh, i hope that i've convinced you to to look to these areas and i'll be very happy to answer any questions i you may have thank you very much thank you Dalla. um I'd like to um, take the chairman's privilege, uh, and particularly this time, I'm, I'd like to ask two questions, if, if I may, uh, on my own behalf. The first is the general one. Um, there's a lot of uh, interesting and sophisticated mathematics in your, your work, drawn from sort of quite a wide range of mathematical disciplines. Are you finding uh, that the mathematics is there just sort of ready for you to pick up and use, or are you, is your work feeding back new problems and ideas into graph theory, linear algebra, and the other domains that you're touching on? <laughs> that, that, that's a, that's a <clears throat> almost a chicken and, uh, and an egg question, yeah. yeah. Uh, of course, uh, uh, you, can, you can bypass mathematics and you shouldn't. We all, we all thrive on mathematics. The, the only issue is that mathematicians and mathematics tends to be a bit general and abstract so mathematician doesn't always think about a concrete problem while an engineer actually if he's, they're not solving a concrete problem they're not an engineer which is also perfectly okay now uh, it's often the case that you need to at least tweak adjust current algorithms for for the problems in hand which means that you do need to understand mathematics in depth but also often you need to design uh, new new mathematical approaches for example, uh, I've done lots of work on quaternions, which are obviously uh, ordered pairs of complex numbers. And if I wanted to do the gradient learning on quaternions, I had a problem because uh, the only differentiable function in quaternions uh, using the kosher riemann futter theorem is the, the linear function. But my neural net is nonlinear. And also in quaternions, we, we lose ordering. So, so not ordering the commutativity, ordering you lose in the complex domain. So A times B is not B times A. And so you can't really think about the chain and product rules. So that motivated me and my team to introduce the HR calculus for the, uh, for the uh, differentiability the derivatives of quaternions. For example, our cost functions, the object is always real, some error square type of thing. So the uh, derivative or real function of a quaternion variable doesn't exist. So we needed to introduce something. Now, of course, then you face sometimes a little bit of opposition from mathematicians because everything comes from a concrete problem, which maybe in order to understand the, the new maybe mathematics, you need to understand the problem a little bit too. So it is a chicken or an egg problem, but many, many uh, interesting disciplines started from, from a concrete problem, and we are not really shying away from that. Well, thank you very much. It, um, it sounds as if there's uh, certainly plenty of scope for further interaction between uh, mathematics and its applications in this domain. I have a, we have a question from William uh, who asks about connectivity. Uh, you used the word connectivity and he asks, is this uh, um, something to do with the same, co same word connectivity in topology? Yeah, so 
I must say that the, the terminology is not unified across the disciplines right. and and I'm not an expert on topology, so I, I can't can't answer. For us, connectivity is basically in a graph represented by say a degree matrix or degree uh, sense so, of so how many connections you have to a node. If you have a neural net, then clearly you think about a fully connected net where each node is connected in one layer is connected with each node in yeah. all the nodes in the next layer. Uh, but then in, in my areas, data analytics, we talk then about sparsity or sparseness, which means that some of those connections are not existing. And you like to have a sparse representation, so to have as few parameters as possible, uh, so that everything you do is maybe more manageable at a very little, at an expense of very little error in, in processing. So I hope maybe that answers the, the question. Thank you. So um, I think we've just got time for one final question from John McQuirta, uh, who asks, uh, what do you understand to be the difference between tensors and multi-way data sets and the implication of that in practice? So, so of course, uh, it's always good to hear from a friend. And I'd like to say hello to John. I haven't seen him for a long time. And John has been his inspiration, obviously, for my work in, in quaternions. And for those of you who don't know him, he's a pioneer of beam, uh, beam forming. So multi-way versus tensors. So again, so it's a little bit convoluted. So uh, when you think about the notion of multi-way, you, you think about nodes. So one node can be time, second node frequency, third node maybe value of FFT at, at, at that window, the fourth node uh, subject, fifth node trial, like in the EEG experiment and so on, then it all has physical meaning because those data, natural tensor data, they're not actual. Now, how, how do you tensorize? Some data are natural tensor like RGB images, but other data you tensorize by performing maybe some sort of transform on data uh, enlarging dimension, folding somehow. So the notion of ways, multi-way, becomes a little bit blurred. So there's definitely need to look into that because tensors do thrive on, on redundancy. If you have redundancy, that means that your ways, modes, can be somehow even mixed. Uh, while by removing this redundancy through decompositions, you arrive at the core, basically, structure in data. So the answer is, yeah, we use the notion multi-way even for tensors which are somehow folded from, from very few modes. Thank you. I'm going to have to, I'm afraid, uh, there are a couple of questions uh, stacked up. I'm afraid we're going to have to um, foreclose on the questions. Um, but before we finish, um, I would firstly like to um, express thanks to um, Professor Daniel Mandich for a fascinating talk covering a very wide range of uh, uh, of concepts in mathematics and a fascinating range of its applications. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And before we close, I was asked by the organizers to show one or two slides about the events of the Institute of Mathematics and uh, what's going to happen in 2001. So it's been a great privilege, privilege and honor to talk to you. Uh, unfortunately, not in person, but uh, should you have any question, uh, anything you would like to ask, I would be delighted to answer offline uh, via email. And I believe my email is on the front page of, of, of my slides. Richard, thank you very much for sharing and thanks to John and, and Maya for enormous help throughout. Well, thank you, Dan Lowe. Thank you to uh, Mini for uh, giving the previous talk in this session. And uh, finally, of course, thank you to the IMA conference team for making sure that the thing actually happened and keeping us technically uh, on the road. And I can now draw the conference, conference to a close uh, dead on time. Thank you everyone at uh, 12 o'clock precisely. Thank you very much okay. and good day.